How can we define good? How can we define evil? It could be said that a good person is someone who is fully conscious of their own limitations. They know their strengths, but they also know their shadow. They know their weaknesses. In other words, they understand that there is no good without bad. Good and evil are really one, but we've broken them up in our consciousness. We polarized them thus. Okay, a quick warning before we start. There are mentions of home invasion and domestic violence, so this may not be to everyone's taste, just to let you know. So, I invite you once again to sit back and relax with your favorite drink, because it's time to listen. Connor Kane was evil incarnate. Nobody had known this about him, however, as Connor successfully led a double life. He was your average policeman during the day, but at night he was a person's worst nightmare. He killed 13 people and raped over 50 in a decade and was never caught or even suspected once. Connor Kane did what he did because he had urges to exert control over and to hurt others. Urges he had had since his childhood. He controlled those urges for nearly two decades, until he had to use force to detain an armed robber. That's when he realized just how good it felt to instill fear into the hearts of men. They called him the Golden State Demon once he gained notoriety. His apparent ability to terrorize the residents of California with near-supernatural powers earned him that nickname. Connor knew not to stay for too long in a single location, thus frequently asked to be transferred around the counties of the state. He also knew to avoid being predictable, and thus chose various weapons and picked his victims randomly. He would stalk a person, or a couple, for weeks on end, gathering as much information on them to make his assault as seamless as possible. He'd frequently use what he'd learned to leave misleading clues behind. He would usually break in quietly into one storehouses in the dead of night, followed by him searching for any personal documentation of his victims so he could pretend to be someone they knew from their private life. He assaulted most of his rape victims in the presence of a spouse or a partner, sometimes even in the presence of their children. Connor would tie his victims and their partners with shoelaces and force them to lie on their stomachs. Then he'd place any available ceramic objects on the partner's back before threatening he'd kill one of them if he heard the ceramics rattle. He forced the complete majority to watch their beloved getting raped, unable to do anything about it. They would lie there, frozen in fear, begging internally for the nightmare to come to an end. But it wouldn't end there. Sometimes he'd kill the people he'd been terrorizing. Other times he'd just stand there, in the dark corner of their room, for hours before leaving, making sure they knew the demon was still haunting them. Connor Kane's evil knew no boundaries. Was once... He raided the house of a married couple at night, during which their young daughter was sleeping with them. The demon tied up the little girl's parents before pulling out a handgun and instructing the girl to face lay down in between them and stare at the wall. He then told her with a menacing whisper, If you so much as move a finger, daddy dies. After that, he violated her mother in front of her and her father. The little girl held down tears and tried with all her might not to move. She didn't want to anger the man who held a gun to her father's head. The father kept whispering under his breath for his daughter to stay strong and not move. She held out for a while, but then an itch crawled up her leg. The little girl tried to ignore it as hard as she could, but it only grew worse, making its way up her thigh growing into an almost painful sensation. It was driving her insane, but she knew she couldn't move. She knew if she moved as much as a fibre of her body, the bad man would notice and then kill her father. 
Seconds became minutes, and the sensation was unbearable. The girl broke. She twitched her little leg, barely an inch, but the demon noticed. A muffled shot rang through the room. Blood and brain matter caked the girl and her mother. These were things of the past for Connor, however, as with the birth of his fourth child, he decided to keep that part of his life behind him. Sure, he was never the perfect father or husband, but he'd never raised his arms against his family. Sure, he was an ill-tempered and violent man, but in his civil life, he would usually reserve his violence to the verbal side of things. And sure, his neighbours avoided him out of fear, but mostly, he didn't seem exactly murderous to those around him. Just a little violent. Oh, if only they knew. If only they knew just how much he enjoys their fear, just like an actual demon. But all of that changed during a town hall meeting that included a few policemen, including Connor and a transfer officer named Jeffrey Bishop. Before the beginning of the meeting, Connor read up on the news about a new serial killer on the state's west coast. One that left his victims in shreds. They've named this savage the West Coast Werewolf because of his brutal way of dismembering his victims. It seemed as if an animal had torn out chunks of flesh from their bodies, leaving behind barely recognizable pulps of bile and gore. Connor attended the meeting, mostly so he could know if there were any leads on him. As he expected, there were none. He had made sure he wouldn't leave any clues leading back to himself. Something caught his attention amidst the conversation about his alter ego. It was Officer Bishop, who had proposed that the fabled Golden State Demon was not a single man, but rather a group of connected individuals or copycat criminals, since in his mind there was no way a man could commit so many atrocities without being caught or compromised by one of his victims. It seemed absurd to an outsider, because it made so little sense to him. That's what set the gears in Connor's head off again. The urges came back upon hearing the words of his newest colleague. He felt disrespected and needed to prove to the newcomer who was in charge. Connor was nearing his fortieth year and had four kids and a wife at home. He knew he couldn't keep up his double life for a long time, and thus he decided that Bishop would be his final victim. A last hurrah for the beast before he could bury it in the depths of his mind for good. And so... He set out to strike a friendship up with Geoffrey Bishop. On so tight, he could know just about anything one would need to know to slip past the man's defences and into his bedroom at the middle of the night. For months, Connor made his way into Geoffrey's heart and eventually they became best friends, at least from Geoffrey's point of view. Connor, well, he considered no one to be his friend. Luckily enough for him, no one seemed to notice his change of heart when it came to his new and only friend. He spent most of his time hanging out with his new pal, which prevented him from being verbally abusive towards others. <laughs> A win-win situation for everyone, or so it seemed. After months of preparation, Connor Kane was ready to strike down his final victim. He decided to victimize Bishop himself while forcing his wife to watch. By this point, he knew the layout of the Bishop family's home by heart. He knew their kid, Michael, had a soundproof room. Connor knew all of Jeffrey's secrets. He knew where the safe was, and he was sure he'd known the code to it. <laughs> their talk loved him. However, he knew the bishops had a spare key under their doormat anyway. Geoffrey'd shown it to him some time ago, when he got locked outside once. So, 
With his plan set, Connor opted to make his move on the night of Valentine's Day. He found the notion romantic to a point, so much so it made him laugh. The days passed, and Valentine's Day finally arrived. Connor, trying to be the best husband he could for a change, took his wife out on a celebratory date. She enjoyed it. They had a good time together, something they hadn't had in a while. The hours flew by. Then, at nightfall, once his wife was sound asleep, along with her kids, Connor got out of his bed, readied himself, and left for the bishop's house. Stealing a bicycle from someone's yard, he made his way through the streets under the covers of darkness. His mind was blank, focused on one thing, taking over the bishop's lives and making them his bitches. This dark contrast to the loving husband and father he'd been just hours before. The Golden State Demon may have started out as a common killer, but in his years of experience, he had become the perfect murder machine. Connor couldn't wait to get his hands on Jeffrey and Brenda Bishop. He could feel himself salivating at the prospect of what he had in store for them. He made it to the street on which the bishops lived, but then discarded the bicycle and made his way to their home on foot. Soon enough, he reached the house and found the family German shepherd, Deacon, in a terrified state. Connor didn't understand what could scare the dog, but he paid no mind to it. After all, he was the boogeyman in the eyes of many. He was the thing in the dark. He was the thing everyone told their children about to make sure they behaved. He was, in his own mind, a god. Connor made his way to the front door, took the key from underneath the doormat, and slowly unlocked the door. He then patiently made his way to the bedroom in which he knew the bishops had been sleeping. Slowly, painfully slowly, he opened the door to their bedroom as to not wake them up prematurely. Once the door was ajar just enough for him to slip through, he slid his frame through the opening and quietly paced towards the bed in the room's center. Once close enough to the bed, he poked at Jeffrey Bishop's arm. Jeff, wake up, he whispered as he pulled out his gun. But no response came. He called out the man's name again. Still, not a sound. Fury coursed through his veins as Connor kicked the side of the Bishop's bed, screaming, Wake the fuck up. Still, no sound came, nor a movement. The bishops didn't budge at all. It was like they didn't even feel Connor's kick. Connor grabbed Jeffrey's body by the neck and yanked him off the bed onto the floor with tremendous force. And that's when he felt it. A warm liquid made its way through his gloves, and he let go of Jeffrey's body cursing under his breath. Shh. <laughs> what the... He cursed as he pulled out his flashlight and shone it around the room. The sight that unraveled before him sent shockwaves of adrenaline across his body. The bodies of Geoffrey and Brenda Bishop were mangled and torn apart. Brenda's torso was torn wide open with her ribs torn outwards and her gut spilled all over the bed below her. Her neck was torn up as well. Jeffrey's body was in no better shape. His neck had been ripped apart and the chest cavity was collapsed inwards with the heart and one lung missing from the grotesque, unnatural cavity. Connor felt fear for the first time in years. He hadn't felt that since that night when he saw his father beat his own brother to death with his own bare hands. The sight of his bloodied uncle tied up to a chair 
as his drunken father beat on him with his fists and legs, flooded Connor's psyche, making him grasp at his head as he stumbled away from the crimson-coloured bed. That night was when Connor realised that the feeling of power over others was the best feeling in the world. But his father could only beat his uncle to death, because that was his uncle's death wish, upon discovery of his alcoholism leading to the development of a terminal illness. But by the time he found that out, Connor Kane was far too far gone. Connor never seemed to grasp that this violent act of mercy had tormented his father. His father? Well, he shot himself before Connor's eyes when he was just twelve years old. The fates had destined to become what he had turned out to be. A monster who could not handle being out of absolute control. I hate you. I hate you. You fucking coward. Connor yelled out into the air as he waved his gun around. Despite the emotional turmoil he was experiencing, the man knew he was dealing with the West Coast werewolf. He'd seen the photos of the crime scenes left by that animal. The bishop's bodies looked the same as all the others. Connor snapped. He tore off his ski mask and screamed at the top of his lungs. Police, show yourself. As he marched around the house with his gun aimed forward. He knew if the werewolf was still in the house, he'd have to apprehend or kill him. There was no other way around it. But after long moments of frantic searching, Connor couldn't find anything. He had one last room to check. Michael's. Mm, you're fucking dead. Connor spat out as he made his way towards the child's room. He pressed one of his hands on the handle and carefully pushed it down. The door creaked slightly as he pushed it open. Connor then made his way quietly into the room, and it was dark, almost unnaturally dark. Connor aimed his eyes around the room, but he could find nothing but a peacefully sleeping child inside. Hark, <sighs> he whispered as quietly as he could before lowering his gun and making his way out of the room. The werewolf, well, he was gone. And that's what Connor thought when the door behind him creaked and he froze. Turning his head back slowly, he saw something dark crawl out of the room. It crawled on all fours in movements that mesmerized the diabolical policeman. He carelessly opened fire on the ever-approaching creature. Every single bullet hit, creating new cavities in the beast's body but it wouldn't stop moving towards Connor, not even with this new array of cavities in his body. The commotion woke Michael up, and upon seeing the child, the policeman yelled at him to get back to his room. Before the kid could even register his words, the beast lunged itself at Connor, slamming hard into the ground. The boy screamed at the top of his lungs. The beast, unrelenting, grabbed at Connor's body before throwing it over its own head with inhuman strength. Connor crashed hard on the floor next to a panicking child. The landing caused him to spit blood, and as he began getting back up to his feet, he came to notice the large humanoid creature looming over him with various wounds, still closing themselves up. Oh, so... You're a real werewolf or something, eh? Connor blurted out as he spat on the floor, looking around for his gun, which had been knocked away from him. <laughs> Not quite the werewolf, the thing retorted in a deep, clear voice. Connor then tried to punch the creature, but it caught his arm, crushing it with its grip. The agonizing pain forced the policeman to wail out. The beast then punched Connor so hard in the chest that a loud cracking noise filled the hallway. Connor lost his breath 
and coughed up more blood as he flew back towards the door. Rolling around in pain, his eyes met Michael's mortified stare. Run, kid, he murmured out before trying to force himself back up to his feet. His whole body exploding with pain and his head clouded from a clear lack of oxygen. But Michael just stood there, frozen. He wouldn't move. He couldn't. Connor staggered back to his feet and tried to shove the child back into his room, but the beast caught his arms from behind and pulled them backward, causing the man to drop to his knees as he cried in pain. But the beast proceeded to place its foot onto Connor's back, yanking slightly at the arms. The man begged for mercy, but the beast wouldn't relent and with a mighty crack, the arms were torn off and thrown to the floor. Connor sank to the floor as two streams of lightning bolts made up of pain struck him at his sides. Connor was slipping into unconsciousness as the beast grabbed him by the back of his neck and bit his head off before throwing it aside. The demon of the Golden State was dead. It was a rather painless death. He felt nothing the moment the two rows of jagged teeth had sunk into his neck. After discarding Connor's head aside, the beast stared at Michael and smiled. A wide, bloody, toothy grin. And Michael, well, he smiled back as he stared around wide-eyed at the carnage that covered the entire hallway. Good job, kiddo, the beast told the child. Thanks. I still can't believe Uncle Connor was the mean man, the child answered. The blood-covered monstrosity made his way towards the child and picked him up on its hands, saying, Well, sometimes the people you think you know the best are the ones you should be wary of. Oh. I'm so tired of pretending to be scared of you, Mr. Upir. I want to go back to sleep. The boy called out weakly, clutching the monstrous frame. Thanks for saving Mommy and Daddy, Mr. Upir. You're the best, the boy said between tired yawns. Mm. Don't mention it. The words came out slurred because of an excessive build-up of saliva. Soon enough, the ungodly shrieks of a child being torn into chunks of blood and pulp in his own bedroom awoke the whole neighborhood. Well, I think by now you're probably disagreeing with what I said at the start. There is such a thing as pure evil. And well, you can't say he didn't get his comeuppance in that story. You weren't expecting that at the end, were you? Nah, neither was I. Well, another fantastic one from Dr. Creepin's Vault there. The subreddit that I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. And of course, there will be more to come very soon. So, please join me again on Friday. Until then, though, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, 
come check me out, okay?